let's go ahead and launch into this one and uh, see what our good friend and triple threat. Oh, oh, oh we're going to watch this one first. Okay, let's watch this one first. Let's watch I this had one this, first. I had this one down as soon as the, the first one. Is that wrong? You're good. Go. Mm-hmm. To fix poor soil issues. One of the things we need to do is focus on the soil's health by giving it things that promote the organisms inside of it, the earthworms, the microfauna. We need to promote them to do their job better. How we do that is we give the soil organic matter, humic acid, compost, stuff of that nature, and it will help amend that soil and make it a lot better. So when we do have our regular soils, they do go hydrophobic a little bit more just because they don't have the amended properties. They're kind of stripped of nutrients or the nutrients are all locked up. As we amend them, they really start to perform a lot better and they won't go hydrophobic and cause these places that are dry. It's not because it's into the natural soil versus the topsoil. You can amend it and it doesn't get hydrophobic as easily. Any soil can technically go hydrophobic and repel water and have dry spots and there are simple fixes for that. One of the things I don't like is that people are adding topsoil to their lawn so they have this nutrient-rich substrate that's two, three, maybe six inches deep but now the roots want to stay in that versus going down in our natural soils. It creates this little pocket where roots will get condensed and they want to live in. I like it when people take their natural soil and amend it to be better. So yes, you can definitely do it. Let's talk about it. DM me, follow me on Instagram, and check out my YouTube channel, The Greener Lawn. It's stuff. Um. I kind of want to hear it again because there was I, I I like I don't think I could have in, fast enough to get everything down that I needed to get down. And... <laughs> Go ahead, let's do it again. Go ahead, cowboy. It's poor soil issues. One of the things we need to do is focus on the soil's health by giving it things that promote the organisms inside of it, the earthworms, the microfauna. We need to promote them to do their job better. How we do that is we give the soil organic matter humic acid, compost, stuff of that nature, and it will help amend that soil and make it a lot better. So when we do have our regular soils, they do go hydrophobic a little bit more just because they don't have the amended properties. They're kind of stripped of nutrients or the nutrients are all locked up. As we amend them, <laughs> they will start to perform a lot better and they won't go hydrophobic and cause these places that are dry. It's not because it's into the natural soil versus the topsoil. You can amend it and it doesn't get hydrophobic as easily. Any soil can technically go what? hydrophobic and repel <laughs> water and have dry spots, and there are simple fixes for that. One of the things I don't like is that people are adding topsoil to their lawn. So they have this nutrient-rich substrate that's two, three, maybe six inches deep, but now the roots want to stay in that versus going down in our natural soils. It creates this little pocket where roots will get... Okay, okay, we're good, water. we're good, we're good. Um, man, <laughs> listen. Where do I uh, where do I begin? Uh, I you know uh, yeah, uh, I, let's just take it. We'll take it line by line here, okay? So let's we'll yeah, let's just start and, there. Let's do this. And we were talking about promoting natural organisms, right? And then and then we were talking about how if we're not adding amendments, then we're sacrificing soils from having things like uh, earthworms and microflora. Uh, and that the, uh, uh, because because they're devoid of nutrients or and or uh, the nutrients are locked up. So we'll just start right there. First and foremost, um, I, I just I want to put this out there. You can take completely sterile sand, right? Completely sterile sand and get anything growing on it. That is that is a plant. Right. And it, it could be uh, it could be nightshade. Uh, it could be a, uh, uh, a maple tree. Uh, it could be a monoculture stand of turf grass if you want. And what's fascinating about this is that as long as something is growing, then the microflora, the earthworms, will all have a habitat habitat will they, where they will proliferate. What's absolutely fascinating is that you can take a petri dish with a with a relatively simple solution containing phosphorus, and uh, and and put it in an open air environment, say like on your desk in your house. And did you know? 
uh, that in a short period of time that you can start growing this microflora right there in open air on your desk. And it will con contain things like rhizobacteria. Hell, it could even uh, contain uh, uh, Rhizoctonia salini, which is just a pretty simple, basic soil-borne pathogen that now all of a sudden is growing in your peach petri dish, right? So I, this, this, this idea that you have to uh, do something miraculous or spectacular to your soil in order to uh, allow for this proliferation of whatever to occur, this magic sauce, this pie-in-the-sky idea, is absolutely asinine. Then to the the whole point, this is what's even more fascinating, is that if you if you subscribe that you 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 have to encourage an environment for all these things, which fun fact, the only thing you have to do is have anything growing on any sort of growing medium, and these will naturally begin to proliferate. But uh, by having something growing there, the whole point of these organisms and why they proliferate in these areas is that the idea of locked up nutrients become unlocked by these organisms, right? So it doesn't matter if they're locked up because uh, due to things like exudates and other types of bacteria and the microflora that ex exists in the soil, uh, they solubilize these relatively insoluble compounds in order to make them plant available. It's the beautiful thing about soil-plant interaction to begin with is that plants will end up inevitably developing the type of growing medium it needs to unlock nutrients and that without any special amendments whatsoever. Um, yeah, what, what, what else did we miss out of that? Because that was, that was a whole bunch of just a lot to say about nothing that was even remotely true. <laughs> well, well, I think Go ahead, Ray. This, this fella, he's got it all figured out because he wants people to do two things. Waste work on shit they don't need to do and spend money on stuff they don't need to buy. Because you know what I hate about people like this? People like this assume that nature is incapable and incompetent and is totally dependent on humans. Because, Matt, you know what you said about sand? And growing grass on sand, I can take sod, right? Put it on top of pure Hawaii beach sand. And in one year, six inches of that sand turns deep, rich brown. And it's not because of some buy my shit stuff that I put on top of it. The grass did that all by itself. Hmm. Interesting. You know, the grass did it all by itself. And yet, Someone like him thinks you need to apply humic and bacteria and heaven knows what else because nature is incapable of sustaining itself. Yeah, if if that would be goodness. The case, <laughs> were the case, you know, how would you have things like prairies? You know, I mean, yeah. I, yeah. Who was out there amending the soils in order to create these vast prairie expanses that exist? Fun fact, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't anything. It all started with just something growing on it. And again, How many times did you fill up your permagreen on the African savanna? Um, none. Um, <laughs> Good none. point. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm and sorry. How, how many people have grown a houseplant and then all of a sudden they get like white flies? And you're like, how's that possible? It's in a completely controlled environment, but all of a sudden I've got white flies or I've got aphids on plants I'm growing indoors in a completely controlled environment. It's fascinating that nature finds a way to be able to do these things. And so the idea of crappy soil is, is number one, is a complete and total farce, right? It's a, Mm -hmm. uh, it, there has to be a, a, a defined reason to establish that it's crappy soil. And the idea that it's lacking in microflora or microfauna or uh, it's too excessive and locked up nutrients is not, is not a valid reason for having crappy soil. Now, if you, have, if you, if you want to say you have, have crappy soil and you know, it's tainted with high amounts of arsenic and lead and mercury, and aluminum and uh, has a ph of 4.1 then yeah i mean it's that's really toxic soil it's, it's not going to grow anything that's... right that's crappy mm -hmm. soil and no amount of of microflora and humic acid and 
um, uh, uh, juju that you you begin injecting into this is going to make a, a even a remote amount of difference. Listen, there there was a lot that was packed in here, and I think the way that you have to unpack this is not what is said because there's a lot of erroneous information or Time's information that's over. put in such a way to think that you need to do something right uh in, in order to act and i think we'll, we'll we'll see that and we'll talk about that more as the night goes on but the overwhelming thing here is number one soil health okay let's get this out of the way is that nobody is able to yet define what that really means that can that can acro- cut across different geographies different soils different grass types all that kind of stuff it doesn't exist yet there are methods and ways to measure soil essentially as one sample right but as far as uh, correlating that data to anything that's meaningful as far as plant production and health specifically the turf grass doesn't exist right now okay so just stop using that term you know until we have a better idea of what's going on there secondly okay the whole idea that well Soil can be hydrophobic, yes. Regular soil can be hydrophobic. I don't know what regular soil is. I'm assuming that that means topsoil that is just existing. So whether you have a new home and the topsoil is placed back on your home site, or if you live in a home that's 200 years old and the soil that's always been there is, is your topsoil, right? Uh, that those need to be treated differently somehow. I would agree that they do need to be treated differently. However, to sit there and say that, well... You can amend them, you can amend any soil, and it won't become hydrophobic, but still all soils could become hydrophobic. It's a lot of like back and forth there that is just like, okay. And then there's a, a, a baby sh- shampoo plug at the bottom. You can use baby shampoo if you really want to, need to. It will help for a very short uh, and not a very sustained period of time, so... Use that at your own peril. It might work, but there's better ways to do that if you have that problem. If you truly have an issue with hydrophobicity in the soil, meaning the soil is repelling the water that's trying to get down in there. The last thing is the topsoil thing. Boys, <laughs> if I heard if I heard Jeremy right, he said if you have crappy regular soil or what you would consider subsoil, or it could even be the crappy quote unquote topsoil that you have. And if you put good topsoil over top of that, at some depth, three, four, six inches, right? That you're going to create a root bound environment. That's what we call root bound. So just like, you know, for the folks that are listening at home or listening to us on their favorite podcast app, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anything else, right? Check us out over there. You don't have to sit there and boob tube us right through the tubes, right? You can also listen to us in your earbuds at your leisure. But the point here that I wanted to make, gentlemen, when you pull a plant out of a you know potted plant out of that uh, container, right? There's all those roots that are pushed out along the sides. That's the kind of effect he's talking about. And I'll tell you what, I don't see it, right? And to show this point, right, I've inverted, right? Here's a situation here of uh, roots on sand, right? A media that has very little in the way of nutrients, right? It's it's a it's a sterile material, right? Growing down in native soil, and everything's hunky dory there. I've got, I could show you plugs where we've got native topsoil on top of really, really crappy subsoil, and those roots are growing down to that crappy uh, subsoil just fine. Literally, I've got one. I'll take a, I'll take a sample of it this week, gentlemen, and share with you that is literally a uh, old construction and demolition landfill that's capped with three feet of clay and then has four inches of topsoil on it, and that's what the grass grows in, and it does just fine. Roots push down into that clay cap, no problem. Grass is an amazingly resilient plant. It's a poverty plant, right? It's growing in some of the harshest environments on all, on six of the seven continents in this world, on this planet, right? And it does just fine without extra additions of humic acid, extra additions of compost and all this other stuff. I'm not saying that you don't need it in certain situations. I'm not saying it doesn't help. I'm just saying the, the act of blanket making suggestions and saying, well, you got crappy soil, just throw this stuff down. It's going to fix it. Products are seldom not the solution, right? So that is where we stand on that one. Thank you for watching this clip. Be sure to tune in to the Burn and Return podcast on any of your favorite podcast apps every Wednesday where we discuss the industry's hottest news.